So before the break, let me just introduce the first guest speaker, uh, Professor Ning Lan from uh, Shanghai Jiao Tong University. Uh, he is uh, working in the area of, well, neuroscience, motor control, but also uh, he is cooperating very closely with people from medical technology, from robotics. He spent many, many years, I don't know exactly how many, in the United States, in San Diego, and particularly in San Diego, 20 years, 25 years, I don't know, maybe you can briefly comment uh, uh, yourself. And I'm very happy that we have such a, a distinguished uh, speaker in our Shanghai Lecture Series. Of course, it also makes a lot of sense because it's called the Shanghai Lecture, and Professor uh, Lan is uh, from Shanghai Jiao Tong University. So let's now, so uh, welcome. I'm very happy that you're here, Professor Lan. And we're looking forward to your lecture. And so I think we take a five-minute break. We can set up the uh, the uh, presentation and then we come back. Okay, thanks very much for your attention. So, uh, um, as I said before, I have the great pleasure of introducing Professor Ning Lan of Shanghai Jiao Tong University. And I would like to ask him, you know, to take into account that we have many engineers, we have psychologists, we have undergraduates that are not familiar with uh, the with neuroscience, with motor control neuroscience. So I would like to ask you to sort of take into account the kind of very interdisciplinary audience that we have and use sort of as little technical jargon as possible. Okay, well, thanks again for coming and the floor is yours. We're very much right. looking forward to your presentation. All right, uh, thanks, uh, Ralph, and it's nice to see you again. And it's been uh, some time. And I um, really appreciate uh, inviting me to this uh, interdisciplinary audience and to, uh, to the lecture. And this is my first time to the lecture, and actually I didn't quite have any, uh, much of the idea in what uh, you know, the, the materials that will be presented and the uh, audiences will be. But uh, after sitting in the first half of the lecture by Ralph, and I think I got... Uh, some ideas about uh, what you uh, really this uh, classes is. And uh, you talked, uh, uh, Dr. Pfeiffer talked about uh, the sensory motor coordination uh, in the robotic system. And actually, sensory motor control coordination is a huge topic of uh, neuroscience and neurophysiology and uh, rehabilitation in terms of application. Application. So, uh, the in uh, in preparing the slides, and I was originally thinking about uh, some of our uh, recent uh, uh, research uh, paper that we published on the cortical muscular communication of movement information. Now, the second part by central regulation of spindle sensitivity is something that's very uh, very technical in terms of neurophysiology. I gave you some explanations, so hopefully that you will follow me in the lecture. Um, might, uh, might be a good idea to start from this slide. Now, it might be uh, easier for you to look at uh, the neuromuscular system. Uh, for you engineers, is probably not uh, quite familiar with the structure of the system. So I will start from the structure. Um, I'll start from the structure here of the uh, different levels of neuromuscular system. So hopefully I'll give you uh, some kind of introduction here. Now we have, at the very bottom of the system, we have our familiar musculoskeletal system that we, everybody we have, we has, uh, we have, and then the, we have muscles in here. We have muscles. Muscles control the joint, produces movement, which is the actuator that you have in your muscular, in the robot. But we also have sensors embedded in the muscles. These sensors produce information, feedback to the, to the, to the brain, 
which produce the uh, sensation and all our other uh, information feedback. And one of the big, uh, one of the long-standing issues that uh, we, as a neurophysiologist, is looking in the sensory motor system is the communication in the motor control, the cortical muscular communication of movement information in the motor system. And specifically, this uh, specifically this uh, communications, these questions relate to how do proprioceptive afferents encode joint angles? You talked about uh, earlier, uh, Dr. Pfeiffer talked about uh, the sensation of joint angles and other type of sensations, but here we deal specifically with one information, which is joint angle. And the proprioceptive information, proprioceptive is the information regarding to the body of its own. That's uh, in, in neurophysiology is carried about in by 1A afferents, we call it. And the second issue is the peripheral, how is the peripheral neuromuscular system in form of the central decision of the joint angle? In other words, if the brain tells the muscle to move from 20 degree to 40 degree of the joint angle, how does this peripheral system be informed? And this, is, this type of questions has not been clearly answered, has not been clear answered. And particularly in the motor system, we have different kind of motor neurons, which uh, I'll explain a little bit. But one type is the motor neuron which activate the muscle, we call alpha motor neuron. The other type of motor neuron is the gamma motor neuron which control the spindle of muscle. And I'll, give, I'll, I'll come back to that a little bit more. The spindle of the muscle. So for a long time, we know that alpha motor neuron is like activating the motor system. So we know that the uh, function of that pole very well, but we do not know uh, what's the function of the gamma motor neurons in the motor system, because half of the motor neurons of the brain controls the gamma motor neuron. Even though the gamma motor neuron controls the spindle, the spindle does not produce much of the force, very little force. But it has half of the, half of the motor areas dedicated to controlling the gamma motor neurons. For that reason, it has to be some kind of function. But up to still, up to this point, we are not quite sure what its function is, except that uh, we know that it adjusts the sensitivity of this complex structure of the spindle. Uh, so in order to give you some more ideas about uh, what uh, the uh, spindle function is, so I want to go a little bit on the physiology of the uh, spindle structure. This is the muscle here, and we normally have uh, hundreds of spindles running parallel embedded within the muscle. And here we only show one, it shows only one spindle fiber. And within the spindle, it has the uh, very complicated structure. As a sensory organ, this spindle structure is probably second, only second to the eye. Eye is the most complicated sensory organ, but uh, the spindle could be the second complicated uh, sensory organ in our body. It has a um, it has uh, 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 three types of uh, fibers embedded in the spindle. One is back one, the second is back two, the other is uh, chin fibers. These fibers uh, senses dynamic information, for example, muscle stretch, velocity, and acceleration. And also, as, uh, the chin fibers senses the static information, for example, muscle length. Right? So if you can sense muscle length, then you can translate that information into joint angles. If you can sense muscle, the velocity of muscle contraction, then you can translate that information to the velocity of joint, joint movement or uh, rotation. And what's interesting is this is not only a sensory organ. It also has motor innervations coming from gamma motor neurons so that we uh, uh, mentioned earlier. And in this gamma innervation to different type of uh, fibers, uh, the gamma 
gamma dynamic fibers, gamma D dynamic fibers innervates uh, fiber innervates bag one and bag bag two spectral fibers, which are dynamic, which are sensitive to the dynamic information, and gamma static fibers innervates the chain fibers, which change the sensitivity of these chain fibers. That's change the sensitivity to length change of muscle, and so on. So this is a very complicated and dual uh, innervating uh, structure of sensory organ. It has the information carrying back to the brain, 1A and second, 1A efferents and secondary efferents. It has the descending uh, uh, control by the brain. So this is a very complicated structure. Then, uh, because of the time, so I cannot go very detail of the, uh, uh, the further. And one of the, this, the, the, the motor control issue is to understand how this information is being sent back to the brain. It's sensed and characterized by the brain, as well as how this information is uh, changed. The information is changed by the motor control. Why do we need motor control? to the spindle organs. So people have uh, studied uh, the human spindle behavior in the wrist, and they recorded the gamma, they recorded 1A afferents in here, actually characterized 1A afferents uh, with joint angles. And they found uh, in a large range of joint angles, the spindle firing from the chin fibers, uh, from the gamma dynamic, the steady state firing, is proportional to joint angle. So you have a direct correlation of 1A efferent uh, in, uh, firing rates to the joint angle. These are in human uh, subjects and uh, in human subjects recordings. And the other recordings in the animals, they started the, uh, they started the recordings in animal movement, and they found that uh, sensory feedback, 1A efferent feedback is also linearly correlated to joint angles in all the, this is in a cat, in the, in the hip angle, in the, in the knee angle, and the ankle angle as well. So there's a strong correlation of 1A efferents with joint angles. And what's more important, what's more interesting is recently the scientists at uh, uh, England, uh, they recorded the, a uh, gamma static neurons and gamma dynamic neurons directly in the behaving animals, in the walking animals, they found that gamma static is modulated in phase with joint angle, and gamma dynamic is bursting in phase with acceleration of joint movement. So it's, it seems that the brain is sending the similar type of information that wants the joint angle to move through gamma static and gamma dynamic channels to the muscles, to the muscles. So there is a two-way then there is a two-way communication between the cortical level and the muscle levels. So the question that is, uh, uh, then the question that we set out to answer is: Does the gamma static command represent the central coding of joint position? If so, what is the form of this relation with joint angle? And then the second question specifically we are asking is: Can joint angle be decoded faithfully? Still from proprioceptive afferents, in the presence of gamma fusel motor modulation of spindle sensitivity, we call the gamma control fusel motor control, because it changes the spindle sensitivity. So, in that case, and can we still faithfully um, decode joint angle information? Uh, I have to look at the uh, time carefully. So. Uh, we tried, in order to figure out that, try, try to answer the question, so we did uh, three hypotheses. The hypothesis, for, the hypothesis of one is that the fusion motor control is basically modulating the sensitivity in a constant level, constant level. So the first is a zero order hypothesis. The second is that the, uh, uh, the brain module, the gamma static, at the gamma dynamic gamma static commands in a first order, in a first order, in a linear fashion with joint angle. The, th the three, the hypothesis, uh, the third hypothesis is the, that the gamma static gamma static command is modulated with joint angle in a second order uh, fashion. So we actually didn't do ex any experiment, but we did computational approach to answer these questions. 
The reason we can do a computation approach is because we have developed a uh, realistic model of the upper arm with the realistic muscle and sensory properties. And in this model, we have only three pairs of antagonistic muscles included. But actually, this model is, uh, is being validated and it can produce the realistic behavior of the real muscular systems. So with, with the model, and we did a bunch of simulations, we positioned the arm in different places, in different positions, and then we look at the sensory feedback. The spindle, we have a, in the model, we have a spindles embedded, the spindle model embedded in the, in the muscle. So we can, given the, given the control, we can look at the gamma, the efferent feedback, and we can also control the spindle sensitivity gate by gamma static, and gamma dynamic, but here we look at a gamma static command. So in these simulations, uh, let me just show you a little bit uh, of the, uh, 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 what's the sensitivity, gamma static sensitivity is. And in this example, the joint angle is not changing, so muscle fiber length is not changing, but we have gamma static increase in six muscles, uh, in uh, six muscles of the upper arm, and then we have also gamma static decrease. You can see the 1A efferent increase, decrease in corresponding with the joint, with the gamma static commands. In this example here, we have the gamma static hold constant, but the joint angle changes. So we can see that the 1A efferent in all muscles changes with joint, with joint angle, because joint angle changes, muscle length changes. Then you have the uh, uh, information, you have the uh, uh, one a efference changes with muscle length. So this is a landscape of sensitivity with the you know, six muscles that we tested, and with gamma static and uh, with gamma static and joint angles. And they showing in general uh, nonlinear uh, characteristics of the sensitivity landscape. And primarily in the short length, in no levels of activation, and you see nonlinearities in high levels of um, activation, see nonlinearities, and some of the breaking activities in the middle of the uh, uh, landscape. So the first hypothesis with simulation we tested, we found that constant strategies of controlling sensitivity of spinosity, and um, although it produces linear information, it pro produces it produces linear relationship between uh, one efference and joint angles. But we know that gamma commands are modulated with movement. So constant strategy is not what the brain is implementing. So we rejected this hypothesis. Then what about linear modulation of gamma commands, gamma static command with, with uh, joint angles? And with linear modulation, we see that the output, the 1A output, 1A efference, did not display a very linear behavior. It has a, a saturation somewhere, and it was a nonlinear behavior. Thus, this uh, result is not uh, consistent with the experimental findings. So we rejected this hypothesis as well. So, but if we modulate the uh, if we modulate the gamma static command with a nonlinear second order fashion, and then we can reproduce the uh, linear relation in the 1A efferents with joint angles uh, very uh, robustly. And so um, with, this, uh, with this strategy of, uh, with this uh, quadratic strategy of control of uh, gamma static sensitivity, uh, we believe that uh, the linear relation between 1A efferents and joint angle can be reproduced. And therefore, this hypothesis accepted. So, with this testing, then we can basically say that uh, the, the gamma commands, basically what I'm saying here, the gamma static command can be used by the same as the central nervous system as a channel to communicate the joint angles that the central nervous system desires the peripheral joint to move. So there's a two-way communication. 
So before, where gamma static commands is simply uh, uh, viewed as a uh, uh, motor output to adjust the sensitivity of the uh, spindle. But with this second, with this um, uh, quadratic control strategy of sensitivity uh, control, we believe that the gamma static command also carries the information of joint angle that the brain wants the peripheral nervous system to move, the joint angle information. And this furthermore has an implication to the, uh, has an implication to the, uh, to the uh, 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 motor control paradigm that we're thinking that the brain is implementing, which we call the dual control paradigm. In this dual control paradigm that we have um, we're thinking that the brain is uh, controlling position, joint position, and the movement separately. In other words, the brain controls static posture of the joint and dynamic movement of the joint separately. So this might be different from what the robotics is doing. And why does the brain use the two structure to control position and movement? And we don't know yet. But at least evidence showing that we have we have gamma static and gamma dynamic information that carries position information and a movement at that acceleration information. We also have uh, alpha commands that are dealing with that are very specifically controlling the dynamic aspect of the movement. We have uh, alpha static commands, alpha static commands dynamic command to controlling the dynamic aspects and alpha static command to controlling this, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, postural movement, postural aspects of the movement. So uh, we, at least in here, we had, uh, we're showing that gamma static command could be used to implement what we call equilibrium point control, which is equilibrium point control, which is part of the uh, part of the uh, whole movement aspects is the postural control. So with this, with this, uh, uh, this uh, 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 conclusion, then we have actually uh, advanced a little bit of our understanding of the neural control of the movement implement in the brain. So we hope that we have, have done that, but still this remains a hypothesis, and we need experiment to uh, validate this hypothesis further. Well, I think I'm about the uh, time, so uh, I will end my uh, talk here. So. Okay. Okay. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Lan, for I think a very clear and also for an interdisciplinary audience, a uh, very uh, easily comprehensible lecture. And I think it's very important, and many of us in robotics know the value of the cooperation with people from neuroscience, in particular motor control neuroscience. And, uh, you know, as we have seen and as you have been suggesting, it might actually be interesting for us to look at what the brain does and we may actually build by, by doing that and by trying to sort of transfer these insights to robot construction, we, robot construction, we might actually be building better robots. Okay, well, so thank you very much. I think that was very clear, very inspiring. And uh, I would now like to open the floor to the global virtual lecture hall. So if there are any questions, uh, this is the chance to, uh, to do so. So do we have questions or comments from the global lecture hall? So maybe, I mean, uh, maybe I can, if there are no questions at the moment, maybe I can start uh, with a question. Now, of course, you know, we're uh, in robotics, we're not neuroscientists, but we'd like to learn from neuroscientists. What, what's the best way? What's, where should we start? For example, let's say I, here in Karlsruhe, in Germany, they work with humanoid robots, and they work on, for example, grasping robots, grasping objects, you know, recognizing grasping objects, opening doors from a refrigerator, you know, putting things back, and, you know, things like that, manipulating a kitchen. 
So what would be the best way, where should we look to learn most about the, uh, you know, how the brain actually performs these? And let's say, I, I guess what we're interested in is not so much, you know, at a great level of detail, but sort of insights that we can easily transfer uh, to uh, robots. Uh, um, I, I think that's a, a ultimate question. It's a very, <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure I can uh, 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 give you uh, the, the most appropriate suggestion, but and in terms of my uh, understanding, at least, um, your robot now has many of the uh, characteristics of the neuromuscular system that are built in, in the in the as a human in the system. Right. So right. that gives you a uh, very that gives you the foundation to start actually saying uh, how uh, start actually saying how that the your computer or your controller can mimic the brain function. Uh, but I I would like I would like to say that unfortunately we we don't know actually too much about how the brain controls the uh, complicated uh, complicated structure of our neuromuscular system. We're still in a very early stage in understanding the brain's uh, uh, function to you know to uh, the function of controlling this uh, structure. I think the uh, the embodiment idea that I learned from you may have some implication to the brains are actually the brain is actually learning it, learning the peripheral system, and actually memorize it and uh, uh, use it in its programming of the muscle control, in its programming of the muscle control. Uh, what actually uh, what actually makes a difference is that the brain has this tremendous capacity of adaptive learning, which you have uh, alluded in, the, in your lecture that the robotics is doing it as well. But the, the way that the brain probably learns, control, learns to control this structure, this complicated structure, is different than what you are doing right now, which I don't have much of the, uh, uh, the uh, insight. So. Okay. Uh, that's probably where you should start to see how does the brain actually learns to control this complicated structure. Right, right, right. Okay. Thank you. So I think we have a question here from Karlsruhe. Yes, go yes. ahead, please. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yes, a yes. A bit louder. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah. I was wondering the following. That you explain us how the muscular activity works and how a muscle is controlled. I was thinking if you also maybe characterize the way those patterns and control signals are stored in a memory and the brain. Like if there are particular controlling, so kind of units on our brain or if the whole pattern is like pre-stored or somehow reproduced like for particular actions. Like I, I don't know exactly how that works in the brain, but it will be interesting to know more about it. Yeah, yes. Uh, um, the, the brain has uh, different structures that are involved in movement control. Well, the ultimate output uh, is in the motor cortex, but the motor cortex is only the output stage. And within the brain structure, there is a po what we call the motor programming structure. Um, when they use the motor programming, the terminology, it it uh, refers to like uh, that we have a computer program earlier in the early days. But actually now it is not exactly a motor program. When we call it a motor program, so it's a structured, a sequenced action or sequenced the motor uh, output pattern that are stored in the memory, that are stored in the memory, and it's recalled every time when a movement is controlled. So the, recall, the, the, the formation of the motor program, the storage 
and of the motor program and the recording of the motor program are uh, actually uh, uh, performed in different areas of the brain. Certainly, for example, basal ganglia structure and in the uh, associate cortex, uh, uh, sensory motor cortex, and so on and so forth. And uh, these are the structures that are, these are the informations that are stored, learned, and stored in those structure. And when there's a sensory stimulation, for example, when you want to grasp something, and that, and there is a uh, command which uh, sent to that structure and says, okay, evoke this motor program and do that task. And this kind of, uh, then this motor output was replayed, was recalled and replayed, and then outputted to the muscles in the, in the periphery. And then the brain has to check whether that action is performed. So the sensory feedback that I was talking about actually went sent back to the, sent back to the brain and to evaluate the performance. Right, right, okay. So maybe we can take one last quick question. Uh, we're over time, but let's take the last question also from Karlsruhe here. Okay, Okay. Um, you mentioned All right. uh, You mentioned the brain uh, controls the static and dynamic uh, behavior of muscles separately. So yes. as a mechanical engineer, I w I'm wondering about the implementation. How can you, act I don't know if you can um, actually comment on this, but Usually, if you have a stepping motor, for example, the, you just set the position and the velocity just emerges. And if you have a DC motor, you set the velocity and the, uh, the position is just the result. So can you actually send both signals somehow, like technically? Uh, yes, uh, that's the different, that's the different, different step between a, a, a ro robot system and a, a, a neuromuscular system. Now, the muscles... The muscles have the muscles have uh, different type of fibers: the slow fibers, faster fibers, and they are actually innervated by different kind of um, uh, motor neurons in different sites. So the brain can actually control those different motor neurons independently. The, we call it uh, a motor unit. So uh, uh, basically, when we're controlling the position of the uh, static position of the joint. We are actually evolving, uh, ev involving those uh, small motor neurons, small motor units, which are slow fibers, very slow. And we are controlling faster movement. With the motor system is actually evoking those uh, large motor neurons, and motor, uh, controlling motor units. That those are fast force generating, fast contracting fibers. So they're, they're, the muscle fibers are actually, uh, their dynamic properties are different. And the brain takes advantage of that, uh, takes advantage of that uh, difference in the in the, uh, in the in the motor actuator in the muscle fibers, and to, to be able so that uh, the brain is be able to uh, control positions and movement separately and sending commands to the peripheral separately. Yeah. Very good. So th okay. So thanks very much. So thank you again for a very inspiring lecture. All right. Thanks to the audience also for the questions and the discussion.